Morning, the first uh, word that God gives us that's uh, the first service of the year. It's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And Psalm 23, verse 5. And uh, let's read these words together, these two verses uh, back to back together as one church before the Lord. Um, so uh, let's read together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, for us Koreans and Asians, we love blessings, right? So every beginning of the new year, we say, Happy New Year. I mean, I guess like uh, Americans as well, Happy New Year. We want a blessing from God. We want uh, something good from heaven. Uh, even the world that does not believe in God also wants blessing of God. Um, you know, as you know that uh, some of us go out to the Palo Alto train station to talk about God, to see where they are with God, and if they even are with God. And uh, sometimes we get, as you can expect, we get a cold shoulder and say, not interested. Even before we say anything, not interested. So sometimes I ask, what did I say <laughs> that makes you respond that way? But how should we respond when they say, not interested, to our faces? Should we also say, I'm not interested in you either, <laughs> and just brush it off? No, we don't. We say, God bless you. And the surprising result is, you know, the coldest heart, the most stone-faced stone person who not even looked at you would even nod. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> they want the blessing. They know that life is so uncertain. They don't know what tomorrow holds. Everybody wants a blessing, something good. They don't even know what the blessing is, but they want something good to happen in the future by a more powerful person than themselves. They know they cannot, we cannot control our lives. So everyone, every human soul, every person that God has created in his image is in fact thirsting after the blessing of God. If everything, everybody, even a godless person thirsts after a blessing of God, how much more the children of God who serve God and who know God, who, is, who, who knows God to be uh, every, who brings every good and perfect gift, don't we so much more eager the blessing of God the Father? And the great news is that God wants to give the blessing. Amen? He's a God who wants to bless us. Some of us, maybe through the distorted image message of the world, we think God is a stingy God. He's keeping the blessing to himself and hiding it from us. We have to somehow shake his throne to, to squeeze out the blessing from him, do some favors for him, for him to bless us. But the God of the Bible is very different from what the culture, or maybe how you might think, assume who God is. I recall the, the story of how God fed the people in the desert, wilderness, for 40 years without skipping one day. He fed millions of people every day with bread and meat and with water. Amazing. And it was abundance that he gave with, he gave everybody. He didn't count the heads of people and so this is the daily portion and you eat it. But he gave them enough. Um, abundantly each day. We're also reminded of how Jesus fed 5,000 men, just the men, right? So probably 10,000 people with five loads and two fish. And uh, again, he didn't count how many people are here, so times uh, $7, and so he didn't do this. He had 12 basketfuls left of food. Abundant God who wants to bless us, who wants to give as much as we can receive. 
And uh, this is the God that the Bible teaches us to be. He has a different scale than all of us can ever imagine. But why don't we feel it? Do you feel it? God's blessing? What is the problem here? How come God is an abundant God and he wants to give and he does give, but we don't feel like we're blessed and we're always thirsty for more blessing? Well, maybe it's the problem is upon, on our part. Uh, it was uh, William Carey, the modern uh, missionary, first missionary to India that said, you know, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God, right? And we tend to do the very opposite of that. We expect very little of God because we fear we might not get it. We might be disappointed in God, so we don't expect much of God. And we don't attempt much for God either because it's risky, because it's hard, because we might fail. So we don't risk anything and we don't get anything. Maybe our God is so small. Maybe our faith in our good God, our abundant God is so small that we don't experience this amazing blessing that he has for us, in store for us in 2020. But the Bible says, Jesus himself says, you know, ask and you, still, you shall receive. Uh, you know, and, and, and a knock, and the door will be open. And Jesus gave us this, this blessing, this uh, promise that he will bless us. So what is, a per what is the response of a person who really believes in God's blessing? We have to be ready. We have to prepare our vessels of blessing. It's like this, I guess, you know, you hear from the forecast as you are heading out today, you hear that there's going to be a rain shower, shower rain at 1 p.m. If you really believe the uh, weather forecast, you would take an umbrella with you. Not here in the Bay Area, <laughs> just, just <laughs> wet it out, is it okay? But you would take, if you know a storm shower is coming, you would take an umbrella with you, if you really believed it, and you do, right? And we take umbrella outside before we exit out. If we truly believe that God is abundant and he is good and he wants to bless us and he can bless us, wouldn't we prepare a vessel, a container to receive God's blessing in our lives? And uh, we know this, this container is called faith. We want to open up our faith as much as possible. God, I want the full blessing that you have in store for me. I don't want to restrict you by the measure of my cup, of my vessel. This morning, the first message that uh, God has put on my heart and I'd love to share with you this morning is this. Uh, how can we be the vessel? What kind of vessel can we prepare to receive God's amazing, overflowing grace uh, this entire year. And uh, it connects with the uh, focus that uh, is written on here on, in my back. Uh, the first is this, how can we receive the blessing? Well, how can we prepare the vessel of grace? It is by uh, preparing the, the vessel of the poor of spirit. When our hearts, our spirits are poor, we can receive the blessing of God. In fact, this is not my words. These are the words of Jesus Christ. The very first sermon that he preached on the mountain as he revealed the secrets of the kingdom of God. Going back to verse uh, 3 of chapter 5 in Matthew, Jesus says, can you show us the verse again? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's very simple, right? In order for us to receive God's blessing, we need an empty cup. We need an empty vessel. If we have a vessel, if we have a cup that is filled with my agenda, if it's already filled with all the things that I dream of, if it's already filled with all the anxieties and worries that I have in this life for 2020, there is no room for God to bless us. We cannot contain what God wants to give us. That's why Jesus says, Blessed is he Blessed is she whose spirit is poor, is empty. There's a lot of room for God. From the standpoint of God, the person who is blessed is one who wants to and needs to rely upon God. 
There is so much emptiness in their life that they, they, are, they are helpless. They are wanting the intervention of God in their lives. In God's perspective, that is the person that is most blessed. He or she is the person who acknowledges that only God can fill this void, this emptiness in my life. He or she, in fact, is a person who is hungry for God. Will never be satisfied except for the things of God. Those who are poor in spirit, they are the blessed one, Jesus points out. Um, our, uh, when we had a previous uh, revival service like many years ago, there was a Pastor Choi who came to speak to us. And uh, in his book, um, his book is called Deficiency, you know, Lackingness. Uh, and in that book, it said, he says, uh, deficiency or, or your lack of, or your state of lacking is a state when you have to stop. Like when you are lacking gas in your car, you, you cannot but stop. You cannot keep running, right? You cannot keep driving. You have to stop. You come to a halt. If there's something wrong, something shortcoming in your car, a uh, part, you have to stop. You can't keep going. You can't keep driving. And this, this uh, shortcoming, this brokenness, is, this is something that only God can uh, fill us. And in those moments, we tend to stop. And it is a time of blessing when we focus on God. We finally get to look up. We're so busy in our lives, running around, walking around, thinking and planning and communicating. We don't see God. God, where are you? I don't feel you. I'm so dry. But in those moments when we are made to stop, in those moments when we are deficient, when we are broken, when we are poor in spirit, then do we start to see God. Then, we, then do we start to see the blessing of God in our lives. Therefore, these weak moments, deficiencies, these lacking points in our lives are in fact blessing in disguise. It is God's channel of blessing for us. That's what Jesus means by blessed are those who are poor, who are broken in the spirit. In fact, the people in the Bible experienced this. I can recall Jacob, right? Jacob, he was at, at his uh, uncle's house, Laban, for more than two decades. He served his uncle, and he became rich. God blessed him with uh, many wives. Well, that's not a blessing today, right? <laughs> but he blessed him with many, a big family, many kids, uh, 12, in fact. And also uh, blessed him with uh, many sheep, cattle, and camel, and goat. He was this uh, huge, you know, uh, this rich guy. And he remembered the promise of God. He wanted to go back to the promised land, the land of Canaan, that God had promised to give him. So he was heading back the way home until he re realized that there was a part in him that was terrified. Because the last time he met with his brother, his brother Esau, he remembers Esau's eyes just bloodshot, ready to kill Jacob, for Jacob had stolen the birthright of Esau. He had wanted revenge. So he had to run away. Jacob had run away all the way to Laban's house. Now he was coming back, but he was afraid. He knew he had to come back. He knew that God had commanded him come, to come back. But he was terrified, and he had to stop. Um, when he heard that Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men, are these men a walking party, or are there soldiers to assassinate him? He wasn't sure. So what did he do? He separate, He sets apart his wealth, like in, in three big groups. He sends them ahead of him, ahead of himself, so that it would appease Esau as a gift, that uh, his heart would be softened, right? And he sends the, all the wealth, all the gifts to his brother Esau, and he is at the river Japheth. And at the river, he finally sends his family, his precious wives, his, his sons. He sends all of them over across the other side. But he's afraid. He had to stop. He had to finally be on his knees and ask God's blessing at that time. Who does he meet? You know the story? He meets the angel of God. And they were wrestling all throughout the night. Jacob was saying to this angel, bless me. I won't let you go unless you bless me. 
and uh, it was dragged on for, for all, all throughout the night. So as you know, the angel had to hit him at the hip and uh, the, joint, the socket was mis uh, re misplaced. And he finally, the angel finally blessed Jacob. He says, what's your name? My name is Jacob. I'm the deceiver. No, your name shall be called Israel. You have wrestled with God and prevailed. He got, he got this amazing name, his blessing from God. And the first light of the next morning, he was able to cross over the river, and he was able to restore that love relationship that he once had with his brother. More than restoration, it was a union. It was a, uh, a beautiful uh, love uh, joint by the two brothers and this family. And Jacob was able to live out the faith life that God had called him to live. Jacob, in his most difficult time, he sought the blessing of God. This was a blessing to him. This difficult, this conflict was a difficult, was a blessing for him in disguise. I'm reminded of a, a hymn writer by the name of Fanny Crosby. If you know uh, a lot of hymns, you remember her name on the you know, title uh, for, as the, the writer of all, many, many psalms and hymns. She is known as uh, the hymn writer for D.L. Moody and Sankey. When they sang, when Sankey sang, she was the secret composer. She was the writer for all these amazing, tremendous grace songs that, that uh, touched so many people's lives in the past century. And uh, the story is that Fanny Crosby, when she was born, she was little, she was a child, a baby, in fact, she had this eye infection, but they treated it uh, poorly, and she lost her eyesight for life. And this, uh, this uh, tremendous you know, uh, incident caused her to go in deeper relationship with God. And uh, she, although she had to live as a blind person all her life, she wrote so many beautiful songs and poems and hymns to God that it touched the hearts of so many God's people. Once a person came to ask her, Miss Crosby, uh, if Jesus were to open your eyes, what would you do? And this was her response at once. She says, you know, I don't need my eyes to be opened. I know when I go to heaven, my eye, there will be no blind people. All the lame will walk. All the sick will be healed. There will be no blind people. So I don't want to be healed right now. But what, what I do want is when I go to heaven and my wa eyes are open wide, I want the first thing, first person I want to see is my Lord Jesus. You see, Fanny Crosby, although she was blind physically, her spiritual eyes were open. She had to stop more in everyday life. She had to appreciate, she had to pray every day to God. And she was able to see so much more than you and I uh, could ever see. And that's why maybe she wrote this, this song, uh, Blessed Assurance. And it goes like this, perfect submission, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with this goodness, lost in his love. Although she could not see, she was seeing. She was seeing Jesus, watching and waiting, looking above, and filled with God's goodness in her lives. Her poor in spirit, her brokenness, her deficiency, her lacking in life was a tremendous blessing for her. Brothers and sisters, do you wish to be blessed this year? That was actually a question, not a rhetorical one. Do you want to be blessed this year? Yes, I would. Yeah, amen, brother. You know, hallelujah. I want to be blessed a lot. I mean, I want all the blessing if, as much as possible. If we want the blessing of God, we must have a, a poor spirit. We must have an empty vessel before God. We need to recognize the weaknesses that we have. We need to recognize the shortcomings that we have before God. People around you and I might think, oh, that person is doing okay. They're doing well. They're strong. And uh, I'm jealous of them even. But you know, every one of you know inside, you are not that person. You are all broken. You are, we are all shortcoming. We are, we are deficient in some way. As we acknowledge before the Lord, Lord, I cannot see. Lord, I cannot speak. Lord, I do not have the faith. Lord, I live this double life. Lord, 
I need you. As we recognize and ready our poor spirit vessels each day, we will be ready to receive God's blessing, God's tremendous overflowing blessing and grace every day. I pray, I bless, you know, in, in God's name, that all of us, Cornerstone Church, will be blessed because the poor, the brokenness of our hearts every moment of 2020. So we need to feel, we need to expect now, what, what can God bless us with? What is that blessing that we really seek after this year? Not what I want, but what God, God, what can you give me as a blessing this year? I have now emptied my cup. I have a broken spirit. I am poor in spirit. God, I need you now, but what will you give me? We need to have the right expectation, right expectation of blessing for this year. And again, we go to scripture to find that answer. And we go to David's poem, Psalm 23. What will God fill us, fill our empty hearts? Um, the first is worship. I put here grace of worship. Uh, this is my prayer for us. And there could be many applications, but this is uh, the important application that uh, I have uh, prayed for and want to present to all of us. We want to be blessed with God's, uh, God's grace in, through worship. And secondly, we want to experience the life of the witness, abundant life of the witness of Jesus Christ. And what more could we ask than these? For just sake of time, we'll look at the first part this Sunday, the, the grace of worship. And next week, we'll look at the life of witness, how these things can be blessing in our lives. Going back to Psalm 23, we remember the very first verse of 23, which we haven't read. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Because the Lord is my shepherd and my Lord and my God, there's nothing deficient in my life. I am satisfied. That's what David is proclaiming to himself and to all the people around him. And uh, he explains to us, he shows us, not explain, probably just shows us a picture as a shepherd and a sheep and uh, a master at a banquet, a uh, guest at a banquet. He gives us these pictures of how God has satisfied him because God is the shepherd, God is the, the master of the banquet. And we come to verse 5, verse 5. It says that, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows because God is my shepherd and I have no need and the result is you have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows uh, you have to understand the context of this the first part from part of this first can you show us that no that's right there it says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies it wasn't just, you know, David was, uh, he, uh, you know, go a couple morning, I feel, feel blessed. He feels anointed. There was a time when there was turmoil in his life. When there were, he was uh, before his greatest, greatest adversaries. When he was being accused of, of evil, he was mistreated by the world. It was at the, at the point of, with the enemies, before his enemies, he says, God, you anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. What does it mean that uh, God had anointed his head with oil? It's a way of saying that, God, you have made me VIP, a honored guest at your party that you invited me to. Uh, would you feel honored and, uh, you know, grateful if, if you came to my home and I suddenly poured some uh, olive oil on your head? How would you respond? Would you like that? I guess you would. <laughs> uh, I would never do that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like it. Oh, gross! Why aren't you? Why are you uh, pouring oil on my head? It's uh It's not a way of saying. You know. Um, it, it's not a way of cleansing somebody, but it is a way of honoring them in those days because oil and incense. These things were very precious things in back in those days. So it was given for the most dignified, most uh, important person that you want to honor and exalt. And this is what God did for David. God anointed David as king. God anointed him every day and acknowledged him, recognized him. You are important to me. You are my son. Through you will come the Messiah. David had, uh, got the recognition of his status, a spiritual status 
as he was anointed with God's oil. And not only that, his cup never ran dry. Maybe he was drinking wine, and the banquet master is continuously pouring wine uh, so there is no lack of wine. He's drinking, and, and it's overflowing now. And that's what David is picturing. God, you are so good to me. You have given me more than I need. And you are good all the time, and you have acknowledged me before even my enemies. And therefore, Lord, because you are my shepherd, I lack nothing. Worship is a time we are spending with God at the banquet table. That's what David is picturing here. He didn't actually drink wine and eat food with God. You can't, he's spirit. But he's picturing spending time with God. You have, when I'm worshiping you, you recognize me as your son. When I'm worshiping you, you fill my cup with joy and your grace. We find many people being encouraged, in fact, filled when they are worshiping God. Right? One of those people we find in, is in the Old Testament. His name is Isaiah. We looked at him in the fall last year. Isaiah, prophet, he was sad. He was dismayed because his king, Uzziah, had died. A great leader for the country had died, and he was dismayed. And Isaiah, God took Isaiah to the throne room of God in heaven. God showed him all the angelic beings, the four angels, and praising God, glory, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of high. And, and Isaiah saw this. And also God uh, touched his lips, his unclean lips, with cold, burn it. And he, he recognized him. You are now clean. Don't say you are not clean. You are clean. You are my servant. After this amazing, glorifying experience, he, he was filled. He was recharged, so to speak, spiritually to the extent of he was able to service the kings after him, uh, Amaz uh, 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 Ahaz, King Ahaz, and also King Hezekiah. Isaiah fulfilled the duty of God that was assigned to him through this amazing filling of the grace of God through the worship service of God. Another person I recall in the New Testament is the Apostle John. Remember John, he was old when he was writing the book of Revelation. And he was on this island called Patmos. Maybe he was dismayed looking back at his life. I've lived my life following Jesus Christ, but now I'm this prisoner on this island. I'm going to die here lonely and wretched, and nobody's going to remember me. And also, I know that all the per churches are being persecuted by Caesar. The churches that I planted, the churches that I invested in, in so much, these churches, I don't know if they're to survive. And so John was dismayed. But the most troubling thing for him was this, maybe. All the other fellow disciples, all 11 of them, have been martyred for Jesus Christ. They have experienced a glorious death. But look at me. I'm 80-something years old. And I'm here. I'm not martyred. I have disgraced our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe he was thinking this way. And at the moment... God shows up, and just like Isaiah shows him a heavenly worship service, he sees the 24 elders giving praise to God, casting their, their crowns before the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees the four seraphs, the angels that uh, Isaiah saw, praising God, holy, holy, holy. After this amazing experience, this filling in his life, filling of the worship of grace, he was able to finish his life as he finished the book of Revelation. Afterward, he was set free, and he set foot on the church in Ephesus, and he finished his life as a pastor at the church of Ephesus. We can be filled. We can expect God's blessing and God's fullness in worship service. You know, uh, last year during one of our early morning services, I shared this story about uh, this worship experience that I had. You see, uh, being a pastor, you know, I've been a Christian all my life, basically. Been to many churches, been, been many choirs, many praise teams. 
Uh, I have seen some, you know, amazing orchestras and music performances. I even played in an orchestra, can you believe that? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so I have heard it all, you know, and uh, seen all the great uh, pipe organs and the choirs, 100 person choir and great services, right? But uh, it pales compared to the one service that I still recall when I was in Dallas Seminary. It was the most maybe difficult time in my life when I came over from seas, from overseas, from Korea, to study at Dallas Seminary. And the study was tough, right? And uh, we, have this, uh, we had this chapel service right in the middle of the morning that you had to attend for credit or you're going to fail, right? So I was dragging my feet into the chapel service. I'm just too, being too honest here, am I not? Uh, you, you had this fantasy of me, but now it's being shattered. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to come to service. I was tired. I want to study for the quiz that's after the chapel service. And I, not just that, I was just tired of studying. It was competitive, and so much work was being requested of me. And it was also a time of financial stress, because we just had our baby. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure as a household... Uh, the man of the household, if I could really sustain my family through the seminary period. And we sang a song, as we usually do. It was not a, you know, a glorious song with all the orchestra and the band and all that. It was just maybe on a piano. It was the song of the, it was a seminary hymn, in fact. And it went like this. All hail the power of Jesus' name. I'll see that next part. Let angels prostrate fall. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Oh, Lord of all. Sorry, I messed up. You know, for the strangest reason, I don't know. I was just in tears. Seeing around me were professors, you know, seminary professors, and my fellow other students who are struggling just the same. Looking at their background, they had come from business, they've earned big businesses. Some of them have even PhD in engineering. It was as if they, were, they had cast their crowns, their small crowns, upon Jesus Christ. God, I give up my career for you. God, I give up my comfort. In this life for you. I give the security, give up the security of my family to you. I give up my life to you. And just being there with the other saints who are casting the crowns before the Lord Jesus Christ. And just to, to fathom the thought that I am one of those people also here. I'm doing all this for you, God. For some reason, there was tremendous joy. It was nothing amazing. I mean, I, would, I didn't have big dedication. It was a tremendous honor to give my life to the one that deserves it all, who owns it all, who owns my life, and to express it, and to be here. It filled my heart with joy. And I confess, you, confess to you that uh, I was able to finish the seminary years and uh, all the trying times that came uh, after that because of that worship service. Brothers and sisters, when you are dry, when your cup is dry, where do you get your filling? Where are you getting satisfied? Where do you look to when your cup is empty? In 2020, when the, wor when the world, when the enemy is trying to devour you, and surely he will, when you are going through the valley, the shadow of the valley of deep, when you are before your enemies, when you feel, you see the great wave just trying to collapse and engulf you, then I pray that you would experience the grace of, the tremendous grace of God in worship at the meeting place of God. What more can we ask? Because when we're asking for the blessing, the grace of worship, we're asking for God himself. An undivided time when we spend with God. God, I need you and I want you. I cannot go on another week, another day without your blessing, without your presence in my life, without your touch. Isn't that the poor in spirit? Wanting God more? When we are wanting God in our life and we're expecting God's grace in his worship, 
you and I will be blessed tremendously to be able to tread and conquer the places that we never imagined we will be able to go right now. Let us hope in the blessing of worship each day this year. Let us expect great things from God through worship. And this is the psalmist, the, the attitude of psalmist uh, as he looked at worship. Psalm 34, verse 9 to 10. Let's read these two verses together. Uh, it's on the screen. Let's read it together. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. It says the young lions, they can't even hunger. But, I mean, you have to understand the context, right? Uh, we are the king of the food chain right now, but, you know, lions were pretty high up there back then. And so lion, you know, they, they, they hardly starve. But even though lions may suffer and uh, they may be hungry, but we will lack nothing because of the Lord. Because we, we seek after, we pant after God himself. So what can we do? How can we receive God's blessing? Let us hope and let us thirst after the worship of God. Asking God, God, I want to stay a little bit longer in worship. I want to hear every prayer in my uh, in the worship and let it be applied to me. Father God, I want to sing every verse, every stanza of the worship songs to worship you, to spend time with you, a little more, more with you, a little more prayer with you, a little more praise with you, a little more worship with you. When we have this poor in spirit, God will bless. Some people have this mindset that, uh, you know, oh, worship has started, but it's okay. Uh, Pastor Joseph will start preaching like in 30 minutes, so I still have time. I mean, not here in this worship, but some people might have that thinking. But worship starts at 10 o'clock. Worship starts at 11.30. Worship starts at 8.30 in the morning, the first service. And it is not just religiously, rigorously taking, uh, uh, keeping up with the time, but it is an attitude saying, God, I want every bit of your blessing. I want every word to praise you. I want every prayer to lift, be lifted up to you. I want every word from the word of God to be preached to me. As we have this uh, eagerness before God, we will experience the overflowing joy and worship of, of grace of worship this year. So, brothers and sisters, let us uh, expect great worship from God, the overflowing uh, grace of worship from God each day, each Sunday. Amen? And uh, I have one more just practical application I want to encourage you with. And uh, one of the things uh, we want to really pursue together is worshiping not only here at church, but at your home. Let your home be the temple of God as well. That's why we're doing these seminars. We're encouraging you and uh, teaching and encouraging how to share the Word of God with your, uh, with your sons and daughters. Because one day they will leave your bosom, right? And it's so short. And we see so many young people. I see so many people out the street. I ask them, do you know God? Do you have know Jesus? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, I heard all the stories in Sunday school. Oh really? Why aren't you in church? Too busy. I hear that song over and over again, and I realize that their faith is not real. There was no faith. Their parents' faith, this fire, was never really authentically transferred to the next generation. It is my burning prayer to God and blessing for us all this year, that we, this year will be a year when you as moms and dads, if you still have kids under your care, that you will be the pastor of your home. You will be the minister for your kids. So faith will be real for them. That this faith, this amazing blessing that we enjoy with God will be their blessing, even abundant blessing for their lives. So let's worship God. Let's really worship God this year. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.